This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. With a payload of 175,000 pounds and a hold big enough to take 128 combat-ready troops, the Lockheed Hercules is truly a giant of the skies. Transports have assumed a major strategic role, conveying troops to trouble spots anywhere in the world and resupplying military operations. And they have saved countless lives by dropping endless tons of food and medical supplies for humanitarian relief. Transports provide the means of not only winning battles, but holding territory. They are the means by which the RAF extends its strategic reach around the world. Up until the First World War, an army's mobility was dictated by how far and fast men could march and the speed of the horse. At the same time, troops had to carry their supplies with them or be resupplied also by horse-drawn wagons. The coming of powered land transport did improve matters, but cars and trucks needed roads, trains needed track and stations and the roads and the rail tracks and the stations had to be defended by troops that could otherwise have been deployed elsewhere. Throughout the First World War, railheads were always prime targets for both artillery and aircraft. The ensuing disruption of rail services would mean a delay in the enemy reinforcing the front and gave the attacker a valuable tactical advantage. It wasn't all trucks and trains. Even in 1918, horses were still widely used and the famous field artillery could still be seen galloping with guns to the front line. The arrival of the aeroplane gradually changed the face of the battlefield. Reconnaissance duties, traditionally a job for the cavalry, were taken over by two-seater aircraft, pilot and observer. Their much extended view from the air provided vital new information to the ground forces. But at that time, the idea of carrying men and materiel by air would have been considered laughable. It was all these flimsy, underpowered early aircraft could do to get pilot and observer into the air. Later in the war, when larger and more powerful aircraft were produced, they were seized upon for use as bombers. But if an aeroplane could drop bombs, then it could drop supplies. In the spring of 1918, during the Germans' last offensive of the war on the Marne in France, Allied forces found themselves cut off. Desperately short of food and ammunition, nothing could get through the sea of mud. And so for the first time, aircraft of the newly formed RAF flew over, dropping small packages in sandbags to the beleaguered troops. They flew round-the-clock missions, but they saved the day. The blockade was broken. When the fighting ended in November 1918, the world was weary of war. It was now time to rebuild and renew. The armed forces could no longer assume unlimited access to public funds. Air Marshal Sir Hugh Trenchard Chief of Air Staff from 1919 knew that the newly formed RAF would have to be cut down drastically. There were even calls for it to be disbanded altogether. But Britain still had a vast empire and it needed protecting. Trenchard quickly realized that here was an opportunity to save the RAF by demonstrating just how useful the aeroplane could be. Even from the beginnings of the early Zeppelins, there was a desire to move across oceans, across frontiers, with relative ease. 
And during the 1920s and 1930s, you saw more and more people wishing to fly over greater and greater distances, not least of which, of course, was to go out to the empire to deploy key people over vast parts of the globe. If you love history, then you'll love History Hit. We have tons of exclusive documentaries about the most important people in history that you will not find anywhere else. From touring the fearsome Nazi seawalled fortifications to the sinking of the Bismarck, History Hit has hundreds of documentaries with access to some of the world's best military historians. And it's not just documentaries either. We have a network of incredible history podcasts bringing you new episodes every day. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Policing Britain's protectorates with the army was very expensive. In the vast wilderness of Palestine, Iraq and India, troop columns were vulnerable. The terrain, varying from deserts to mountain ranges, could be just as dangerous. The RAF could do the job for a fraction of the cost. Trenchard pointed out that his aircraft could range far and wide from easily defended aerodromes. And so they did. But his pilots and ground crew still needed supplies, which had to come into these far-flung bases by air. Fortunately, at the end of the war, the RAF had a large number of heavy bombers surplus to requirements. Many of them were Vickers Vimmies, which had arrived at the front too late to see active service which were now scheduled for the scrap heap. Vimy's made great transport aircraft, plying the Middle East routes, delivering mail and stores. When used as troop carriers, they were admittedly a little uncomfortable, but they got the troops to their destinations in days rather than weeks. One of the first uses of air power in an air transport role uh, was the way in which we evacuated British, British nationals, and indeed the King of Kabul in the winter of 1929. And this was no mean feat. Some 500 people were recovered across the Hindu Kush in a time when they could not otherwise have made it. And indeed, had they made it, then they would have had to fight their way out and probably suffered the same sort of casualty rates as were suffered some hundred years earlier when uh, rebels fighting up in the hills, Mujahideen as we would now describe them, were firing down and virtually prevented every single man who had moved down uh, through the northwest frontier from ever reaching India. Now, for the first time, aircraft could be used to get people out almost with impunity. Civilians, too, found aircraft a valuable means of covering difficult journeys, quickly and safely. Commercial air travel was beginning to flourish using the same routes pioneered by RAF supply flights. By the 30s, Mammoth biplane airliners flew with up to 24 passengers to destinations throughout Europe and the Empire. Indeed, in 1937, a Handley Page 42 became the first commercial aircraft ever to notch up a million miles in service, and without a single fatality. As a practical means of transport, the aircraft was here to stay. In Germany, civilian aviation kept the aircraft industry alive, as after the First World War, Germany was forbidden to have an air force. The most successful passenger aircraft was the Junkers 52, which carried passengers all over the world, as well as troops. The second time that you see air power being used to move uh, a body of troops around, a body of personnel around, was when Franco uh, wished to deploy the Spanish Foreign Legion from North Africa into southern Spain. And here some 14,000 troops were moved uh, without the use of maritime power, which frankly Franco could not have relied upon. And so the ability there to deploy troops into southern Spain gave them an advantage over all other people in the local area. For British manufacturers, orders for civilian aircraft also kept them alive at a time of recession, ready to take on the needs of the military again in the event of war. 
By the 1930s, this did not seem far away. In the face of German rearmament, Britain began to build a new generation of bombers. For the first time, their specification required that they could be adapted for use as transports. But perhaps the most significant development in air transport at this time was the parachute. Parachuting had been a popular sport across Europe since the early years of peace, and parachute drops were a regular feature of the interwar air displays. However, it was the Russians who first saw its military potential. As early as the 1920s, they demonstrated a number of unorthodox methods for deploying troops from aircraft. These demonstrations were performed in front of officers from Britain who concluded that airborne deployment of troops had no use in modern warfare. But to the watching Germans, the parachute aroused extreme interest. They began using the Junkers 52 as a transport during secret illicit paratroop training in Russia. In May 1940, this training was to pay off when German paratroops and gliders spearheaded the Blitzkrieg that hit the Low Countries and France. By dropping enough shock troops on top of the target, the Germans demonstrated just how decisive an airborne attack could be. The Allies had learned their lesson the hard way. Britain had been slow to realize the potential for paratroops. At the start of the war, Britain had no airborne forces. But in 1940, Winston Churchill called for the formation of a force of about 5,000 parachute and glider-borne troops to be used for quick in-and-out raids into continental Europe. He called them butcher and boat raids. Number 70 Group RAF was formed to provide the training aircraft. It was based at Ringway, now the site of Manchester Airport. Not for the first time, internal rivalry hindered development of a new idea. The RAF had no such thing as a purpose-built paratroop aircraft, and Bomber Command, who at that time provided the only means of attacking Germany, were reluctant to give up any of their precious bombers. In the end, a few aging Whitleys were supplied. They were hardly ideal. They had no suitable side doors, so the trainee paratroopers had to leave through a hole in the floor. They weren't careful, you caught the, the parachute pack on the, <coughs> on the side of the aperture, which tilted you forward, bashed your nose on the other side, and it was called ringing the bell. <laughs> so there were a lot of people about, <laughs> budding parachutists, <laughs> with, with injuries to their noses. The other means of delivering troops by air was in gliders, the most widely used of which was the horser. Constructed of wood and canvas in furniture workshops, they had to be towed by bombers as they had no means of propulsion. But gliders provided a comparatively cheap form of transport and did not impose on the aircraft manufacturer's ability to maintain production of warplanes. Since their role was to deliver shock troops, they had the advantage of being silent Flying a glider behind a Dakota was uh, an interesting experience. The Dakota, nearly flat out, with both its engines glowing cherry red or light straw, would totter along with the glider at the back. And it was really just flying in line astern. You were on the end of a tow rope. If you were lucky, you had a telephone conversation down the tow rope, but it usually didn't work. And uh, you just sat there. Although these were relatively simple shells, glider designs became increasingly advanced to a point that in 1944, a glider called the Hamilcar came into service, capable of carrying a seven-ton tank. This was to be the largest glider built by the Allies. Although glider pilots came from the army, 
they were trained by the RAF. Not surprisingly, a glider pilot's job was extremely dangerous, and the high number of fatalities that were incurred meant that RAF pilots were increasingly needed to do the job. The first operations by airborne troops were successful enough to persuade the government to enlarge the force and make it available for more ambitious missions. 38-wing RAF was set up in 1943 to provide all transportation needs. This was part of a new transport command which had been given responsibility across all theatres of war. One of its most critical roles was ferrying replacement aircraft from factories and safe havens well out of the reach of Germany and her allies. Crews had to be trained to fly a wide range of aircraft. Pilots then had to deliver aircraft to airfields all over the globe. Many pilots flew every type operated by the RAF, as well as being the first to fly new aircraft coming from America. One of the most famous was the Douglas Dakota. The Dakota would become the most celebrated of all transport aircraft, staying in service with the RAF for almost 30 years. The Dakota, fitted with side doors, was perfect and allowed the troops to leave, as one put it, like gentlemen. The only Allied aircraft used for the main paratroop drops of the war one of its many advantages was an ability to fly at 110 miles per hour, a speed at which paratroops would not be hit by the slipstream. The Dakota carried up to 18 fully laden men, or three tons of equipment, and could land on short makeshift airstrips. means of delivering special forces and equipment which would be crucial to the success of an invasion was now in place. What air power offered to the army was of course the ability to resupply and to deploy them over vast distances for the first time. A ship for example will move at 20 knots at best, uh, a tank, uh, something about the same sort of speed. Now aircraft could move a body of troops uh, theoretically at something like 150 perhaps even 200 miles an hour an order of magnitude higher than previously uh, capable of being accomplished by surface means. D-Day minus one, June the 5th, 1944. Pathfinder troops clambered into flimsy gliders and Dakotas to form the vanguard of the forces that would liberate Europe. They were swept to the drop zones piloted by the RAF where they were to help establish a beachhead. I got in my glider and I was so frightened, I was 19. And uh, when, they, when I strapped myself in, my teeth started chattering, my knees were knocking, and I had my rifle between my knees, and I was gripping my rifle and thinking, if I grip this hard enough, I shan't, uh, I shan't have my knees knocking at least. And I was so frightened because I thought, well, God, we've got no chance. You know, you're going to take us over, um, 20, 28 men um, to each glider, they're going to take us over, dump us down in France and leave us there. And we knew that we wouldn't get any backup for at least an hour. By June the 6th, 
RAF transports mounted round-the-clock missions, ferrying supplies and equipment to reinforce the Allied positions. As the Allies broke out across Normandy into occupied Europe, the aircraft of Transport Command were to be crucial in maintaining their offensive. After D-Day, where we towed the gliders across, down Ampney, my airfield were the first bunch over, and we did three trips over. First of all, we dropped paratroops, then we towed gliders across with some support in terms of weapons and jeeps for the paratroopers, and then we then we dropped canisters and things of uh, resupply afterwards. And then uh, one of our aircraft was the first aircraft to land on the beachhead without breaking it. A Spitfire pilot went in and broke his aeroplane, but he was the first aeroplane to get on the beachhead. But not all airborne missions were to prove successful. At Arnhem in Holland, nearly 12,000 soldiers of the British 1st Airborne and Polish divisions were cut off from supplies and reinforcements. Despite desperate efforts by Transport Command to relieve them, bad weather and strong German defences prevented them from getting through. The army had total control over the airborne forces that included the Dakotas about what could be done and if they wanted so the army asked for a hundred percent serviceability of the Dakotas at the time of Arnhem but if they wanted a hundred percent serviceability we had to ground all Dakotas and I said this would be absolutely crazy because it would announce to the Germans that something was up because the aeroplanes were not coming in the Dakotas were not coming in to do their normal job and this had to be the next advance and this would advertised to the Germans that we were going to do something or other. Now, the position of the army forces and things of this sort, in my view, was such that it had to be an operation in the area of the arnhem eindhoven area to cross the Rhine. And I said, let us carry on at a slightly reduced rate and give you about 75 to 80 percent serviceability, not 100. No, no, said General Montgomery. That is not what I want, I want this. And of course the answer was, surprise, surprise. There was an, uh, a German Panzer Division at Arnhem on training exercises just when Arnhem happened. Wasn't that an incredible surprise? And the result was that Arnhem was the, one of the biggest disasters of the war. The failure of the operation meant that an opportunity to end the war quickly had been lost but the lessons that were learned were to be put to good use within a few months. Part of the success of the liberating armies in France was due to the clandestine activities of resistance fighters controlled by agents of the Special Operations Executive. These men and women were flown into occupied territories under the cover of darkness, landing in remote fields. The Westland Lysander was designed as an army cooperation aircraft. It made its name in special duty squadrons flying these cloak and dagger missions. The Lysander was ideal for the role. Fitted with extra fuel tanks, it could reach far into the south of France. Its low landing speed meant it could put down in a small field. And its high wing design gave the pilot a wonderful field of vision when looking for the torches which the French resistance workers used to mark the landing strip. It was uh, simple enough to fly and it had a remarkable uh, rate of descent. You come down like, a, like an escalator, not like a lift, but like an escalator. And, um, it had a very, very fine rate of climb too, so it was ideal for uh, landings and takeoffs on short, muddy fields. These were hazardous, long-range flights at night to deliver and pick up agents or VIPs. But they were keeping open a vital line of communication between Britain and the French resistance movement. One was always welcomed into France by a little bit of light flak, and, but uh, just fireworks. But. Uh, we, we flew too high for them to reach us, really, uh, over the coast. 
and then we'd go down inside France to a, a lower height where you could see more easily what, where you were. Although designed as a two-seat aircraft, many of the pilots modified their Lysanders to hold more people. It was not unusual for one trip to bring out three or even four agents. You know, the rear cockpit was designed for one air gunner. Well, we took out all his gear and uh, replaced it with a, a bench-type seat facing aft, where two people could sit side by side. And a third passenger could sit on the floor uh, between their knees. And on one occasion, uh, we brought back um, four people, four adults, escaped air crew. Uh, one of them must have been doubled up on the luggage shelf. And how they all fitted in, I have no idea. But then uh, I personally brought back um, four passengers once. Of, uh, two of them were children, so they were easier to fit in. Operations were only possible on moonlit nights. Pilots were given aerial photographs of the landing site and made their own fold-up maps for navigation. In case they became stranded in France, they wore civilian clothes and carried escape kits. On some occasions, unknown to the Lysander pilots, the people they delivered were double agents. Their cover stories were perfected and they appeared as determined to help the Allied war effort as anyone. It came as a shock later to the pilots to find out what these people really were. A friend of mine who turned out to be uh, a double agent, uh, when he ceased to be my friend, uh, was Henri Dericourt, and he was a pre-war aerobatic and airline pilot. Uh, he, we did a lot of landings on his fields. We had no idea that he was in close touch with a German country espionage people in Paris. And then, of course, there was a court-martial in France uh, after the war at which he was acquitted. Uh, part of the evidence in his um, defense was a pilot's logbook, which he had painfully uh, written out in great detail, all of it totally false. And um, he claimed to have been uh, doing pickup operations as a pilot himself. And um, I checked in a photocopy of this logbook against my own logbook, where I had had him in the back of my aeroplane. That was not recorded, but he recorded a lot of flights with himself in the front of the aeroplane. There is no doubt that these pilots and the men and women they transported played an important part in the war. Through them, the French resistance was kept supplied with information, weapons and stores. In contrast to these single aircraft missions, the Allies were planning what was to be the largest and last airborne operation of the war, the Rhine crossing. The Rhine was the last natural barrier the Allies faced on the way to the heart of Germany. On March the 24th, pilots of Transport Command help carry over 21,000 paratroops and infantry across the Rhine in an extraordinary show of strength. Within hours, the Allies had secured a foothold and were advancing through Germany. The Dakotas went forward with the troops all the way. We'd either capture airfields or landing grounds, give them a number and send the Dakotas across, right up until Arnhem and even beyond up to Berlin. They used to go over with fuel, usually for the tanks, because they wanted that right up the front. We actually landed on an airplane on an airfield once, not knowing it hadn't been captured. And the German troops came out and unloaded the Dakotas for us, which is surprising. Sweeping through Germany, the Allies linked up with the Russian forces advancing from the east. The Reich buckled under the strain. By May, the war was over. The end of the war in 1945 brought substantial reductions in transport command. 
Most of the Dakotas were returned to the United States under the terms of the Lend-Lease Agreement, but some were purchased for the RAF to use until new replacements could be produced. The RAF relied on these Dakotas because there had been an agreement during the war that Britain would concentrate on building fighters and bombers, whilst America supplied the RAF with transports. However, before this agreement was in place, a British manufacturer had already produced one transport type. The Avro York was an assault transport and entered service in 1943. The arrival of huge numbers of Dakotas delayed the York development, and it was 1948 before six squadrons were equipped. This was just in time for the massive airlift of food and other supplies to Berlin. This gentleman was still there who I didn't know, I'd never met. And he walked in and he said, I'd like to introduce you to Air Vice Marshal Donald Bennett. He said, that first Tudor that's on the line, you get down there and get your gang. He said, and strip it. He said, I want everything taken out of it and make it into a freighter. So I couldn't believe it. Anyway, we did it as we told. And about two hours later, Donald Bennett joined us. He got overalls on. He worked with us and we found out we were going on the Berlin Airlift. The Soviet Union had cut all the road and rail routes into Berlin from the British and American sectors of Germany, effectively starving all Berliners not living in the Eastern Communist Zone. This action was the culmination of long arguments over the control of Germany after the war and gave the West a pointer to future Soviet hardline policy. Within four days, Transport Command and the US Air Force had joined forces to airlift supplies to the beleaguered citizens of West Berlin. For almost 12 months, aircraft took off at the rate of one every three minutes, day and night, delivering thousands of tons of food, coal and equipment. There was everything on that. It was like a Dunkirk job. You know, there was Dakotas, there was small aircraft, there was big aircraft flying the stuff in. And I know when they came back here, uh, they were loading up somewhere down south, but they were coming back here for, you know, refurbishing and being looked at. <clears throat> there was flour, there was fungus, there was all sorts going out on the floor, but it certainly shifted the stuff. Dakotas and Yorks bore the brunt of the airlift, joined by Sunderlands of Coastal Command, when their base on Lake Havel was not frozen over. The Soviets were amazed that the city could be supplied purely by air, even in the depths of winter. And eventually, when it was obvious that the blockade wasn't working and would never work, they allowed road and rail communications across Germany to reopen. The Berlin airlift had stretched transport command to the limit. But the importance of resupply had been proven beyond doubt. Even so, the burning need to build up fighter and bomber strength still left transport at the bottom of the list of the government's defense priorities. And by 1951, the magnificent effort of the Berlin airlift just a memory, transport command had been whittled down to barely 50 aircraft. In the 1950s, Transport Command began to receive new aircraft as part of the RAF's overall expansion and modernization plans. The Hanley Page Hastings had actually taken part in the last stages of the Berlin airlift and was joined in 1956 by the Blackburn Beverly. The Beverly was considered to be an ugly monster by aircrew, but quickly proved its worth. A huge payload and impressive short takeoff and landing abilities made it perfect for resupply in remote areas. As Britain began withdrawing forces from around the world, transports which had previously been used for tactical resupply now took on strategic importance. A mobile force rapidly delivered would often be the first troops on the scene. It was essential that the transport aircraft were protected, so fighters were allocated to them for defense. The closure of RAF bases around the world meant that Transport Command faced the prospect of having to fly further to their destinations without having the facility to refuel. 
The solution lay in the emerging ability of aircraft to refuel each other whilst in flight. The jet fighters in particular had only short endurance, but the ability to refuel in flight greatly extended their useful flying time and multiplied the effect of the force. Refueling systems were pioneered by Sir Alan Cobham, a First World War pilot who had become a favourite on the air display circuit between the wars with his famous flying circus. In the early 30s, Cobham made a number of long-distance flights using a second aircraft with a weighted hose to deliver fuel to his airspeed courier. Although leaning out of the aircraft with a steel hook to catch the hose seemed an impractical method, he continued with his experiments. The Air Ministry gave him little encouragement until the invention of the probe and drogue system. In 1949, flight refueling set up an endurance record in a Meteor jet fighter using a Lancaster as the tanker. In 12 hours and 3 minutes, the Meteor was refueled 10 times. From the 50s, refueling probes were fitted to all frontline aircraft and a growing fleet of tankers was created. The Valiant was intended to be the main tanker aircraft, but fatigue ended its life early. Handley Page Victors were now chosen instead. The Victors, formed in special squadrons, immediately showed the benefit of refueling. In one exercise, two Lightnings, refueled in flight by Victors, flew non-stop from Scotland to Canada in just over seven hours, a feat unimaginable before with their normal endurance of less than one hour. Refueling also improved the RAF's reaction time. An entire lightning squadron could be deployed to the Far East in a fraction of the time previously possible. Can you imagine a situation in which all our aircraft could only fly to the distance allowed by their internal fuel tanks? A lightning, for example, would be capable of a sortie of about 40 minutes in duration. Uh, a phantom somewhat more, perhaps an hour and a half, a modern tornado, perhaps of two hours. Uh, but their range would be severely limited, and the time in which they could, uh, they could operate would also be severely limited. So we needed something that would make the aircraft really more potent. Unfortunately, the opportunity was there by air-to-air -air refueling. What did that do? Well, if you take something like a phantom or indeed a tornado operating at a range of some 200 miles and holding a patrol at 200 miles for, say, an hour, that aircraft would have to come back and re-land. Now, if we can extend the, ring, the duration of the combat air patrol at that distance, not one hour, but up to, say, four hours, that aircraft behaves as if it was four aircraft. And that is what uh, air-to-air refueling has offered. It is a force multiplication. Instead of one aircraft, you have four aircraft. And that is one of the great benefits of having air-to-air -air refueling. Plus, of course, you have the ability to strike out far, far more deeply over, well, almost global ranges. Possibly the most famous of these long-range attacks were the bombing raids during the Falklands War. Codenamed Black Buck, the first operation involved 11 Victor tankers refueling a single Vulcan during a 7,700-mile round trip from Ascension Island. There were two main things that came out of the Black Mark missions. The first was, of course, we did damage Stanley Airfield. And indeed, there was a desire in some of the follow-up missions to take out uh, some of the radars. So it was successful in the fact that it did cause damage to the airfield. Uh, albeit it wasn't a huge amount of damage, nevertheless, damage was, uh, was caused. But probably equally important was the fact that it served notice to the Argentinians that now, with the range of the Vulcan, we could actually, had we wished, have attacked their bases uh, in Argentina itself. And one of the corollaries to the Black Buck Raid is that a number of squadrons were deployed from bases in southern Argentina northwards to deploy around the Buenos Aires area, thereby taking them out of the orbit for the conflict that was about to start over and above the Falklands. Perhaps the most radical development for Transport Command was the arrival of the helicopter. It proved its value in the jungles of Malaya in the 1950s where it demonstrated its unique ability to get in and out of the most confined spaces to evacuate casualties or drop off supplies. But as late as 1960, 
the RAF still lacked a helicopter capable of lifting battlefield equipment. The introduction of the Belvedere in 1961 went some way to improve the situation. Its ability to lift weights of 5,000 pounds was vital in jungle areas such as Brunei, where hard-pressed troops were supplied by air with everything from food to 105 millimeter howitzers. But in 1969, after a series of disastrous crashes, the Belvedere was withdrawn. For 10 years, the RAF considered a replacement, but always gave a higher priority to fixed-wing aircraft. It was not until 1980 that the first of 41 Boeing Chinooks entered service. These twin-engine monsters can lift up to 25,000 pounds, five times more than the Belvedere could manage. Their use greatly reinforces the RAF's battlefield support. In many ways, the helicopter represents an ideal vehicle for the functions of transport command. However, its effectiveness is restricted by its short range and lack of airspeed compared with fixed-wing aircraft. Consequently, helicopters will always be deployed close to the scene of action. We went forth with four Chinooks to the South Atlantic with no clear idea other than we were there to provide support, which is the reason why I mean, that's what our job was to do. Uh, regrettably, uh, the circumstances intervened and, uh, and the ship that contained most of our aircraft was, was hit by a, uh, an Exocet missile. We were afloat off the Falkland Islands with four. The ship was hit and we, we, one was salvaged, rescued, if not, flown ashore. So for the duration of the war, we had one airplane. I mean, in the war, it flew for, I think, 108 hours without, without any servicing because th there was nothing. I mean, the, the, the ground crew had no spanners or, or, or oils or anything. It just um, it carried on. But I think it proved itself more after the war, frankly, in the work that went on post ceasefire and has undoubtedly become uh, a solid workhorse in the infantry, if you like. The coming of the jet age in the 1950s did not pass transport command by. The speed with which such aircraft could deliver a payload over long distances made the jet an attractive proposition. The de Havilland Comet became the first commercial jet airliner when the Series 1 joined BOAC in 1952. Transport command looked at this new type to see if it would fit their requirements. It did. Series 2 Comets became the first jet military transports in 1956. The Comet was not the only passenger airliner to join the RAF. In 1959, military versions of the Bristol Britannia were enlisted. These turboprop aircraft had the longest range of all at over 5,000 miles. These aircraft were kept busy carrying troops to trouble spots such as Cyprus, the Middle East, and Borneo. From the bases, shorter range aircraft would then deliver the troops to the front line. Just as the Dakotas had dropped paratroops during the major operations of the war, so now the Beverleys, Argosies, and Valettas dropped them in distant parts of the world. Indeed, one RAF Beverly even saw action in Vietnam. It was very undercover stuff. It was considered politically very incorrect for RAF Randalls to be seen in Vietnam. But my air officer commanding called me along one day and said that there was a requirement. The Americans had asked if we could send one of our aircraft, not for any warlike purpose, but to distribute welfare goods which had piled up because their C-130s were doing other things. So uh, I took that aircraft up for a week's detachment. And we were indeed uh, uh, taking out welfare goods to the Montaillards who were right inland. And so we were landing on some very dubious strips. But of course, the Beverly could do that sort of thing. I remember the Americans being extremely surprised when I checked out on the first day and they said, uh, you'll be flying airways. And I said, no, I won't be flying airways. I'm going to fly beneath the airways. 
because it takes me a long time to climb. The airways, the base of the airways was about 8,000 feet, I think. And they said, you'll get shot down. And I said, uh, I don't think I will. I said, because uh, they won't have seen a Beverly before and they'll be so surprised when I come over the edge of the hill that by the time they've gasped, they'll be gone. <laughs> so we didn't get shot down and we didn't fly airways. However, by the late 60s, these short and medium range transports had virtually disappeared to be superseded by the aircraft that would take transport needs into the 21st century, the giant Lockheed Hercules C-130. As early as 1960, the RAF had looked for a new tactical transport aircraft. After years of development, British aircraft were cancelled in favour of the proven Hercules. The Hercules was originally built for the United States Air Force in the mid-50s and had proved to be a reliable and robust aircraft. As the first Hercules were delivered to the RAF, the Americans were using them to great effect in resupplying troops in Vietnam. They became a lifeline when an American base at Khe Sanh was cut off by the surrounding North Vietnamese troops. Hercules pilots developed various new techniques for dropping supplies and picking up casualties. The idea was to get in and out as quickly as possible so as to avoid the heavy enemy fire. These techniques, including the dramatic near vertical Khe Sanh dive, were adopted by the RAF for their own use. The Hercules has been in service for over 30 years and is the most versatile aircraft in the RAF. Early versions carrying 90 troops have been stretched to take up to 128. They can fly fully loaded for 2,500 miles and can deliver a bewildering range of stores and equipment. In recent years, the focus of military operations has changed to humanitarian relief. The Hercules have been used many times to drop vitally needed stores and food to starving populations in Africa. Well, air power is more than obviously just the weapon of war. Uh, and one can think of things like the Berlin airlift that demonstrate that uh, air power can be used for strategic uses, quite apart from dropping a bomb on a target, which might also have strategic implications. Indeed, one of the greatest uses that we are likely to see air power being used in uh, in the immediate future is peace support and humanitarian operations. There are many countries in the world that cannot be reached by ships, uh, that are almost inaccessible uh, by road, uh, and not only are they inaccessible if there is a civil war or something of that sort going on, many of the surface lines of supply are going to be interdicted by the use of ambushes or perhaps even mines. So we're going to see a greater use of, greater deployment of troops, greater deployment of humanitarian aid from the air. Undoubtedly, the Hercules gives the RAF a huge tactical advantage. Its versatility removes the need for a wider variety of transports. Its short takeoff and landing capabilities guarantee its success in peacekeeping zones all over the world. And its next variant, the C-130J, will take the name into the future with the RAF. <laughs>